You are listening to Victoria Cross Hero, Iraq 2006, written and narrated by Mark Felton. This is an audio-only program for War Stories with Mark Felton. The paramount British and Commonwealth decoration for courage and valour is the Victoria Cross. To be awarded the VC, a service person has to have demonstrated almost unparalleled bravery in the face of the enemy and it is perhaps no surprise that many of the men who have been awarded this simple bronze Maltese cross have either perished in the action for which they were given it, or have come very close to being killed. Since its institution in 1856, during the Crimean War, the VC has only been awarded on 1,363 occasions, making it the rarest gallantry award in the world. The largest number was naturally awarded during the First and Second World Wars, but since 1945, the VC has only been awarded 20 times. This figure includes five awards of the new Victoria Cross of Australia and the Victoria Cross of New Zealand. Since the 1990s, Australia, Canada and New Zealand have awarded their own identical versions of the VC to their nation's service personnel. Before that time, these Commonwealth countries used the British VC. Two posthumous awards of the Victoria Cross were made during the Falklands War in 1982 to Lieutenant Colonel H. Jones and Sergeant Ian Mackay of the Parachute Regiment and they were widely believed by many to have been the last occasions when British soldiers would be in the kind of intense combat where the conditions were right to win a VC. Many believed that the Falklands conflict would be Britain's last true conventional war, with the experience of the Gulf War in 1991, with its smart bombs, war by remote control, and air campaign rendering resistance on the ground minimal appeared to support such a theory. Britain's other commitments throughout the 1990s were in the main peacekeeping operations in the former Yugoslavia, counter-insurgency in a much calmer Northern Ireland, and interventions into Sierra Leone, Kosovo and East Timor that witnessed little in the way of conventional war fighting. However, all of that changed following 9-11. British forces were launched into two of the most bloody and protracted military campaigns the nation has experienced since the Korean War in the 1950s. British forces helped to topple the brutal Taliban government in Afghanistan in 2001 and invaded Iraq alongside US forces in 2003. Once the conventional war fighting was over, the British military found itself bogged down in a seemingly endless counter-insurgency campaign in Iraq until 2009, and one that is currently ongoing in Afghanistan against fanatical enemies and often in extremely inhospitable conditions. The campaigns in Afghanistan and Iraq resulted in the award of Victoria Crosses to British, Australian and New Zealand soldiers. One of the most extraordinary recent actions resulting in a VC was the story of an immigrant serving in the British Army, Johnson Bahari. Bahari was born in the former British colony of Grenada in the Caribbean in July 1979. His early years were marked by extreme poverty, and in 1999 he emigrated to Britain. Like many young men from a deprived background, the armed forces offered the promise of a regular salary and opportunities for advancement that were lacking in civilian life, and Bahari enlisted in 2001. After initial training at Catrick in North Yorkshire, Bahari joined one of Britain's most illustrious county regiments, the Princess of Wales's Royal Regiment, Queens and Royal Hampshires, or the PWRR. Bahari was sent to the 1st Battalion C Company, where he trained as a warrior armoured fighting vehicle driver. The PWRR is one of several new regiments created in the last few decades in the British Army by the constant round of amalgamations of older units forced on the services by successive Labour and Conservative governments following each defence review. The regiment was created in 1992 by the marriage of two equally famous units, the Queen's Regiment and the Royal Hampshire Regiment. The PWRR, through the Queen's Regiment, holds the oldest battle honour in the British Army, 
Tangier, 1662, marking an unbroken regimental lineage stretching back hundreds of years, in common with all of the other local regiments that form the backbone of the modern army. Today, the PWRR recruits from across six southeast English counties, including Kent, Sussex and Hampshire, as well as the Isle of Wight and the Channel Islands. The PWRR is further distinguished by being one of only two British Army regiments that is a foreign monarch as its colonel-in-chief. Queen Margrethe II of Denmark has fulfilled this role since the death of the Princess of Wales in 1997. The regiment's 1st Battalion are nicknamed the Armoured Tigers because they operate as armoured infantry, riding into combat aboard their warriors. The battalion consists of three warrior companies, a fire support company and a headquarters company. The warrior is an impressive vehicle, and it has consistently proved itself in combat operations around the world. A heavy metal beast powered by a 17-litre engine, it packs a fearsome punch with a 30mm Raden cannon and 7.62mm chain gun. In the back of each warrior, a section of seven highly trained infantry soldiers sits ready. As part of 1st Mechanized Brigade in Iraq, the PWRR found itself part of a battle group that consisted of a squadron of Challenger II main battle tanks from the Queen's Royal Lancers, a company of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and C and HQ companies 1 PWRR. The deployment was between April and October 2004, centred on a former Iraqi army base at Abu Naji outside Alamara. Y Company, Reconnaissance and Mortars, 1 PWRR, was located 5.5 kilometres away at Alamara. They were there to protect the Coalition Provisional Authority, based in the Simic House, a secure compound in the centre of the town. The battle group's job was to police Maizan province and its capital of Alamara for six months and assist coalition forces in maintaining law and order. Private Bahari and his colleagues would find themselves driving their warrior armoured vehicles in a war zone for the first time. Intelligence estimated that there were around 300 heavily armed militiamen from the insurgent Mahdi army in and around Alamara. Although they sounded like something last faced by General Gordon in Khartoum, the Mahdi army was led by another religious fanatic, Muqtada al-Sada, and they were considerably better armed than the Sudanese fanatics encountered by the British in the 1880s. Al-Sada was widely liked by the local population, and he had a long history of resistance to the previous regime of Saddam Hussein, who had murdered his family. Into this stew of local politics and religion was cast the 1 PWRR battle group. The British had decided to base their strategy in the region on a previous tour of duty that they had undertaken in the Serbian province of Kosovo in the Balkans. It would consist of a combination of foot patrols, Land Rover patrols and vehicle checkpoints, with their heavily armoured vehicles held in reserve for rapid deployment if the Mahdi army attacked in force. The city of Alamara was in an unsettled state, and only days before the PWRR advance party had arrived, 3,000 Iraqi civilians had rioted on the 3rd of April. The light infantry battle group, which the PWRR were replacing, was glad to see the back of the place. The base at Abu Naji came under sporadic mortar fire on several nights soon after the PWRR arrived, and it looked as though this was only to be a taster of the action to come. Bihari was to be his platoon commander's driver, each platoon having a total of six warriors. In the early morning darkness of the 1st of May, Bihari's company received orders to replenish the isolated Y Company outpost that was sited in the centre of Alamara at the Simic House. Bihari's platoon was the company reserve force, and was the last to depart from the base. But as the company was making its way through the darkened streets towards the outpost, new orders were relayed to it by radio. A foot patrol had become pinned down by sporadic machine gun, rifle and rocket-propelled grenade fire. 
The company was ordered to drive to its rescue with the 30-ton warriors. Six PWRR soldiers had been wounded from the foot patrol during the course of a long and protracted firefight. The rocket-propelled grenade, or RPG, is an old Soviet design that has become a staple of insurgents' armories all over the world. It is a cheaply produced weapon that is easily portable and can be used by an operator who possesses very limited military training or technical proficiency. The design was actually inspired by another cheap and mass-produced weapon, the German Panzerfaust, a weapon that saw extensive use against Soviet tank regiments from the Battle of Berlin in April to May 1945. The RPG consists of a three-foot-long steel tube, flared at one end to allow the rocket blast to be dissipated when fired. The weapon is aimed using a simple iron sight and activated using a grip and trigger. The rocket weighs about 10 pounds and is fired away from the tube using a gunpowder charge. Once in flight, the hollow charge grenade is powered by a small rocket that gives the weapon a range of around a thousand yards, though it is notoriously inaccurate. As it flies towards its target, little fins pop out of the rocket to try and maintain aerial stability, but because it is not directed by the operator, the rocket cannot home in on a target like the much more sophisticated British battlefield missile systems such as Milan and Javelin. Bihari's platoon as the reserve was also ordered to join in with the rescue of the foot patrol. The attack on the patrol was probably a ruse to try and encourage the British to send in armoured reinforcements so that the insurgents could deploy the full gamut of their weapons against them. The insurgents had carefully prepared a killing zone in the city into which Bihari and his comrades unexpectedly stumbled. The platoon's six warriors, led by Bihari's vehicle, started down a long dusty road in the evening gloom. After crossing a roundabout, something immediately struck the platoon commander as ominous when they started along another street towards the sounds of small arms fire in the distance. The street was completely deserted, usually a sign that an ambush was imminent. The convoy halted while the lieutenant tried to assess the route ahead. The road was lined with buildings, between which ran many dirty and narrow alleyways that were perfect rat runs for the insurgents who had gathered ready to spring their trap. At some unseen and unheard signal, all hell suddenly broke loose. RPGs hurtled in towards the lead warrior, exploding with a deafening concussion against the sides and turret. The warrior was struck repeatedly, the big armoured vehicle rocking on its tracks like a ship in a storm. The platoon commander and the gunner slumped in the turret, both wounded and concussed. All around the convoy blazed the muzzle flashes of AK-47s and light machine guns as the insurgents fired on the vehicles from the flat rooftops and from alleyways. When Bihari tried to talk to the lieutenant on the intercom, he was met with silence. When he switched over on the net to speak with the other five warriors, he also heard nothing. Bihari was on his own, and would have to act on his own initiative, rather than wait for orders that may never come. The multiple RPG strikes had disabled the vehicle's communications completely. In the rear of the warrior, some of the soldiers were also wounded. Bihari reacted quickly. He reached up and slammed shut his armoured hatch cover. He pressed the accelerator, and the warrior lurched forward, Bihari trying to drive it clear of the ambush before it was destroyed by the storm of anti-tank rockets that were streaming down from all sides. Suddenly, in the dim light, Bihari spotted a makeshift barricade across the road in front of him, and he immediately stopped. The moment the warrior became stationary, another hail of bullets and RPG rockets struck the vehicle. The warrior caught fire, and soon noxious black smoke began to fill up the interior. Bihari could not see ahead, but realising that inaction would only lead to his death and the deaths of his comrades, he opened his hatch, exposing his helmeted head to the full weight of the ordnance flying around him like enraged hornets. The smoke cleared sufficiently for Bihari to see, and stamping the accelerator once again, he rammed the barricade, heedless of mines or improvised explosive devices, and burst through, clearing a path for the other five warriors to follow. 
Suddenly, the Harry glanced up and actually saw an RPG flashing through the air directly towards him. He grabbed the hatch cover handle with one hand and yanked it down, while keeping his other hand on the warrior's controls. The rocket blew up against the turret, wrenching the hatch cover out of Bahari's grasp and sending a gout of flame into the turret where it further wounded the already incapacitated gunner. When Bahari closed the hatch again, he discovered that the armoured periscope through which he could have steered the armoured vehicle when it was closed up had been smashed beyond repair. He would have to continue to drive with his head sticking out of the vehicle and fully exposed to the murderous crossfire in the street. Revving the engine, the warrior roared on down the road for a further 1,500 metres, the whole time under intense enemy fire. At one point, a bullet actually struck Bahari in the head, but his Kevlar helmet saved him from injury as the round lodged in the inner lining. Bahari kept the vehicle moving forwards, even though the weight of enemy fire was enormous and he was constantly exposed to a hail of lead and shrapnel. The rest of his platoon followed closely behind. Suddenly, Bahari spied another warrior from his company up ahead, and following the vehicle, Bahari and the rest of his platoon arrived outside the Simic House outpost, which was also under sporadic small arms fire. As bullets cracked through the air around him and whacked off the armoured sides of the stationary warrior, Bahari clambered out of the driver's tunnel and climbed up onto the turret. Single-handedly, Private Bahari pulled his wounded platoon commander from the turret and off the vehicle to safety. He then darted back out into the enemy's fire and once more climbed onto the warrior's turret to rescue the wounded gunner. For a third time, Bahari braved the gunfire to lead the dazed and wounded soldiers out of the back of the warrior to safety. Then, when all the men had been accounted for, incredibly, Bahari turned his attention to saving his vehicle. Bihari drove the smouldering warrior through a complex chicane in front of the main gate that was constructed from concrete-filled oil drums and was designed to prevent suicide bombers from crashing vehicles laden with explosives into the front of the Semic house. He entered the compound. Once inside, Bihari pulled the fire extinguisher handles and doused the engine. Completely exhausted, Bahari struggled from the vehicle and dragged himself into the back of another warrior, where he collapsed, his ordeal finally at an end. Although Private Bahari had performed feats of bravery worthy of the highest recognition, he was soon back behind the wheel of another warrior, and once more in the vanguard of his platoon. On the 11th of June, Bahari's platoon roared into action as part of the Quick Reaction Force. An insurgent mortar had opened fire on coalition troops, and Bahari's platoon was tasked with attempting to cut the insurgents off in the dark streets of Alamara. The warriors were being driven at high speed through the empty streets towards where an intelligence assessment had pinpointed the likely origin of the recent mortar fire. Suddenly, in an eerie replay of the events that had so nearly cost him his life the month before, Bahari's platoon drove once again straight into an insurgent ambush. Lining the street at rooftop level were small groups of insurgents who were crouched down and armed with RPGs and AK-47s. With a whoosh and a blinding flash, a rocket-propelled grenade detonated against Bahari's warrior only six inches from the young soldier's head. Although his helmet absorbed most of the blast, Bahari was nonetheless badly wounded. Stunned, disorientated, and bleeding profusely from his wounds, Bahari's head began to clear as more rockets thumped into the vehicle, wounding and incapacitating the commander and the rest of the crew. Scarcely pausing to think, and with his own blood running into his eyes that obscured his vision, Bahari slammed the warrior into reverse and, accelerating wildly, drove out of the ambush zone. Bahari's withdrawal was abruptly terminated by a dusty wall, the warrior crunching into it and coming to a lurching halt. Within seconds, as the smoke and dust began to clear, other warrior crewmen were on the scene, and they lifted Bahari and his comrades to safety. Bahari collapsed soon afterwards and fell into a coma. He spent many months in hospital in Britain, slowly recovering from his terrible injuries, enduring several difficult operations. In recognition of his two amazingly courageous actions, Bahari was awarded the Victoria Cross, 
the first to a county regiment since the Korean War. Although he has remained in the army and is now serving as a lance sergeant, Bahari has continued to suffer from severe pain in his neck and head, as well as having flashbacks to the events in Iraq. In 2006, he published his autobiography entitled Barefoot Soldier, netting a £1 billion publishing deal. It's been rather a long time since I've awarded one of these, said the Queen to Bihari when she pinned the Victoria Cross onto his tunic at Buckingham Palace. Bihari remained modest about his incredible achievements. Maybe I was brave. I don't know, he said. At the time, I was just doing my job. I didn't have time for other thoughts. Summing the whole experience up simply, Bihari said, Some days you the bug, some days you the windshield. You have been listening to Victoria Cross Hero, Iraq 2006, research written and narrated by Mark Felton, for War Stories with Mark Felton. For a wide variety of military history videos, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, which is of course very much appreciated. Please see the description box below for details.